The last viewpoint I want to cover um, is that of Liz Spelke, uh, influential professor uh, in this uh, field at Harvard University. Now, Spelke also takes a constitutive conception of language approach. So this falls in the cognitive view, and, and it does fall, again, in the general stance, meaning that, again, the underlying idea is that there is a fundamental difference between a, a mind that has language and a mind that does not have language. Now, um, Spelke starts from the idea that, uh, in a sense, humans with their closest um, cousin species, so other um, uh, non-human primates, in a sense, we're both very continuous and very discontinuous with respect to uh, our cousin species. Um, we're very continuous because if you think of our sensory and motor capacities, they're really very similar to those of other non-human primates. Um, if you think of our sensory system, for example, our visual and auditory capacities, you know, resemble those of rhesus monkeys. We are, we're sensitive to the same spectrum of light, you know, our retinae uh, are, are sensitive to the same spectrum uh, of light. Um, our um, uh, auditory system is sensitive to um, a similar spectrum of uh, frequencies, et cetera, et cetera. And so in this sense, sort of the, 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 sen the sensory backdrop uh, of humans is very similar to that of non-human primates. And, and the same can be said about our, our locomotion system. Generally, uh, the, the action system in humans is fairly similar to the action system uh, in the brain of non-human, some uh, of our closest non-human primates. So there definitely is no denying that the psychology uh, of humans is a continuum with the mechanisms that exist in, in, in our closest, um, our closest uh, relatives. Um, on the other hand, there is also no denying, and we covered this at the beginning um, of, this, um, of this lecture, there's no denying that there's a, there's a giant gap between the cognitive achievements uh, of humans and the cognitive achievements of any other species. From this point of view, there really are striking differences. Just to give you a couple examples that, that, uh, that uh, Dr. Spelke uh, makes, um, you know, all animals recognize and categorize food and, and pick good food and, and separate it from bad food, but only humans develop you know, the chemistry of cooking. Um, we, 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 um, all, all animals uh, seem to learn something um, about the behavior of the material world, you know, how, for example, there's basic physics, how, how things uh, fall and how things move, but only humans systematize this knowledge as science and extend it to encompass things that, that, we, that are you know, either too far away or too small for us to either sort of perceive or, or, or act upon. Um, and, and certainly um, many, um, many uh, close species to humans also uh, are organized in, in societies, but only humans create systems of laws and political institutions um, to, to guard and to organize these societies. So again, the, the idea just being that while there's a strong, uh, let's say, neural and neural mechanism continuity between us and our closest non-human primates, uh, there also is a giant discontinuity in terms of what we can do compared to our closest uh, non-human primate uh, cousins. So the question, of course, is why? Why would there be um, so much continuity? Why? How are we at the same time so close and so far from our closest cousins? Um, and the idea, or rather the answer um, that Spelke suggests is that the, the, the main difference between us and between non-human primates is the ability, is the presence of language in our mind. In fact, not just language, but the, co the fact that we have the compositional semantics of natural language, the fact that we have an instrument to combine thoughts. In a sense, if you want to be somewhat reductive, we really are the mind of an ape on steroids. The steroids are natural language.
according to Spelke, then um, our, our brain is made of, of core old knowledge systems that in fact we share with other species. So um, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a young child, we come into this world with a, a number of knowledge systems that are present in many other species. And you're seeing here sort of a list of some that are often discussed. For example, a natural geometry and navigation system that kind of allows us to, to understand uh, geometry, an object mechanics uh, system, which allows us to generally understand how things work, um, a module for color, a module for goal-directed actions, um, um, a module to, to get a sense of how numerous a set might be. Uh, and we'll get into this in just a moment. So the idea is that our mind has the same backdrop as that of um, our, our close non-human uh, primate relatives. We have these, these old systems of knowledge, but see, these system of knowledge are uh, modules, meaning they're separated from each other. For example, they're domain specific in the sense that e each of these different modules that you're seeing um, they only operate on a, on a specific subset of entities in the world. Uh, you know, color, the color module only operates on, um, you know, color information. That's it. The number sense only operates on sets and tries to get a, a vague estimate of, of the quantity of a set. If it's a lot, if it's, a, you know, a very little, little, a lot, or, or very, very much. Um, so each of these, these systems that we share with other species uh, and that we come into this world equipped with are very domain specific. They're also task specific, meaning that the, the representations that are construed by each of these systems only guide a specific subset of actions and cognitive processes relative to that module. So color only processes information about color um, and, and the only thing that it does is uh, represent color information. Um, similarly, these modules are informationally encapsulated, meaning that each one is its own thing and, and operates perfectly fine by itself without the need of input from any other module. And finally, and perhaps crucially, um, these systems in our mind are relatively isolated meaning the internal mechanisms and, and the internal representations of each of these modules are opaque to the rest of the system. So just to make an example, your object mechanics um, uh, module um, that does not have access to the representations and to the inner workings of your color module. Okay? And your color module does not have access to the inner mechanics uh, and representations of your goal-directed actions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these, these modules that we come equipped with, us just like many other species, um, they, they each operate on their own thing. They have their own representations and they can operate independently of other mechanisms. And also they are, they are opaque to the rest of the brain. And so this is the initial state. So as I was saying, these modules are domain specific, meaning they only operate on a specific subset of entities in the world. They're task specific, meaning that the, the representations that they, that they construct are, are meant for a very specific subset of actions and operations. Um, they're informationally encapsulated in the sense that they only operate, that they operate without the need of other uh, input from other systems. And finally, they're isolated. The inner workings and representations of each of these modules is opaque to the other modules. And now here is the big difference. As we grow and as we acquire language um, in a way that is not exactly um, um, fully described yet, language seems to have a capacity to permeate and to enter each of these modules and really serve as a lingua franca. In a sense, 
language can get into each of these modules and can now access the representations of each of these modules and make them available to other modules. So now, you know, the representations of the object mechanics module, let's say, thanks to language, are available to the color module. So now the color module can actually use the representations of object mechanics. And, and, and through the compositional semantics of language, you can now combine the representation from different modules together and create complex thoughts, which would have been unthinkable up to the moment when language entered into the picture and, and allowed us crosstalk across these different modules. Let me just give you uh, an example, and this comes from um, a wonderful paper by Caruthers, um, uh, who really thought, uh, who really sort of argues that some thoughts without language are really entirely unthinkable. Um, uh, let me give you uh, sort of a, a, a simple, um, a fairly simplistic example. So imagine this circumstance, there's a, um, we are in a room and there's a plate of pasta somewhere um, in this room. Now, originally, so before um, language enters the picture, our color module uh, might be able to observe this uh, circumstance and quote unquote think, oh, there is pasta by the green wall. And I'm highlighting the green because this is the module specific type representation. Uh, so your color module um, can, um, can represent color. Um, at the same time, probably um, our natural geometry and navigation system um, might look at the scene and say, ha, huh, there is pasta to the right of the long wall. And again, I'm highlighting the words that are module specific. So each of these modules, as, as I said earlier, can, can process a certain, a certain subset of information, whatever is the information that is relevant to that module. Um, but see, the two modules cannot talk to each other. And that is where language comes into play. So now if language connects these two modules. And now if the representations of one module are available to the other module, you can now put together these representations and create a complex thought, something which would literally have been unthinkable until you had language, which is the thought there is pasta to the right of the long green wall. And you can see how this, this thought is combining the representations of the color module and the representation of the natural geometry model. Until language was available in our mind and its ability to combine representations, uh, in fact, to access representations inside these modules and then to combine them, until that happened, the thought that something can be to the right of a long green wall is unthinkable because there's no mechanism other than language to bring the representation of these two modules together. And so according to this viewpoint, the, the real magic of language, which, which would also explain the big discontinuity, well, the continuity and the discontinuity between us and uh, other non-human primates, uh, the magic of language is that it can suddenly permeate these otherwise opaque modules, and, and it, can, it can take the representations from inside of these modules and, and can act as a lingua franca that can, can allow these, these different modules that, that used to speak languages that were unintelligible one another and can now put them in communication and can now combine representations from each of these, uh, from each of these modules.